Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. This is the 21st of November, 2021, and some actually really, really nice updates this week. As always, if this is useful, uh, please like, subscribe, comment, and share, and hit that bell icon to get notified of new updates. As always, I have the chapters along the bottom of the screen, so you can jump to particular updates you care about, and in the description, I have them all laid out in detail as well. New videos this week, I created a deep dive video on the new Azure Gateway Load Balancer. If I have network virtual appliances, there were previous challenges with putting them in highly available configurations, manual routing, this solves all of that. Then I also did a quick video on capacity reservation, something I've discussed previously, but now I actually go into a bit more detail about them. Let's get on to the new features. So on the compute side, we now have these VM applications. Previously, what we would do is we'd create a custom image. We'd take the operating system, we'd add the applications into it, and then put that in the shared image gallery. The challenge with that is every time there's an application update, we have to go and update the image, which is possible, but a lot of work. In my old days as a consultant, what we'd rather do is have a plain OS image, and then layer the applications on at time of deployment. This new VM application capability helps us do exactly that. Now, what was the shared image gallery becomes this new Azure Compute Gallery. It still has the capability of images, but now we can also store these VM applications. So if we have a quick look at what this actually looks like, so we're gonna jump over to here. So what we'll see, let's close that. If I jump to one of my subscriptions, what I can now search for are these VM applications. We see these definitions and versions. So here I'm looking at my definitions. So the definition is really just the idea that, hey, I have this idea around, well, the gallery it's stored in. This is stored in one of those Azure Compute Galleries the name of the application, the OS it supports, and the description. And then once I have the definition, what I'm then gonna do is actually create a version of that application. And obviously the application version has the detail. It actually contains, hey, what is the source for this package? Is it a zip file, is it an MSI, an XC? There's all different types of things I can use. How am I installing it? How am I uninstalling it? Other configurations. So I have all of these great capabilities that I can now actually use. And again, this is gonna be part of that Azure Compute Gallery, which if you remember the shared image gallery, the whole point of that is I can have that replicated in multiple regions. I can have multiple copies of it to handle certain amounts of load. And what I can do with these VM applications is then use an extension to apply them to my virtual machine or virtual machine scale set. So now as I scale actions out, hey, it will go and add these applications into it. I can also add these to existing um, virtual machines I might have. I can configure them via the application, the advanced tab during a deployment as well. So I'll probably do a more detailed video on these, but this is a really nice new capability. Leading on, we also now have a run command update. So previously the run command was okay to run an inline command, uh, maybe some local script, but they really worked on enhancing that run command capability. So now, yes, I can still call an inline script, I can call a local script, I can call a uh, something from a blob and it will automatically create a SAS to give me access to that. It's a single file though, it's still dealing with some single file, I'm passing it to run command. But what I can now do is I can run multiple scripts. I can have multiple instances of this run command going. I can have them either sequentially or they can run in parallel. If I want them sequentially, again, I can now define these as part of, for example, an ARM template and I can have it depends on. So if I want it to be sequential, I can say, hey, this run command instance depends on this previous run command instance. So I can now make them run sequentially. I can make them run as different identities within the guest operating system. So a run as within that guest that is actually applying to. 
And again, I can apply it to a virtual machine scale set. So as scale out actions might occur, hey, I can actually go and run these various commands. The custom script extension is still there. So that's another way that I can run things inside of a guest OS. The custom script extension, I can actually pass that a shared access signature I have generated. Maybe it's to some uh, other storage account that I don't have native kind of access to. I can pass multiple URIs to the custom script extension. And I can have a custom command to execute that doesn't have to hard code to PowerShell or Bash, something the run command does. So there's still a case for both of them, but definitely run command uh, has got a lot of really nice new powerful capabilities. Azure Spring Cloud has a number of updates. So remember the Azure Spring Cloud is all about giving me that easy deployment of Spring Boot microservice applications. So that builds on the Spring framework to make it easier to have things like auto configuration, dependency, standalone applications. Well now I can actually stop and start these to optimize my cost. I can bring my own persistent storage. So now instead of having its own what it manages storage account, I could use my own storage account. So now I can have things like bring my own key. Um, I can have my own encryption, my own network access controls. And there's a new easy service connection with a resource connector for things like database storage, key vaults, and other things. The Azure VM selector has gone GA. I showed that a couple of weeks ago, so I'm not gonna show it again, but the link is in the description below if you actually wanna go and see that in detail. And Azure Functions has a new Azure SQL binding in preview. So we're seeing this a lot with Azure Functions at the moment. They're adding more and more of these rich abilities to connect to services to make it easier to bind to them. So with just a few commands and parameters, I can now really easily interact with Azure SQL Database. There's a new library to accomplish that. Azure Kubernetes Service has some nice disk updates. Typically, we're gonna have multiple nodes, multiple container hosts, and a pod will run on one of those hosts and use a managed disk for a persistent volume claim and a persistent volume. Well, if something happened to that host, the pod has to go and start on a different node when it takes time for that disk to go and actually get connected and be useful. So one of the updates is now we have this shared capability from the managed disk. So a disk will now actually be connected to multiple nodes in that AKS cluster. So if there is a failover, it doesn't have to waste that time going and doing that actual disk connection. There's now supports for ZRS disks, that's in GA. And that share capability works with both LRS and ZRS. And Azure Files NFS is now supported as well on AKS uh, in GA. There is this new SKU. ND96AMSRA100V4, um, it's GA. So this is all built around this AI supercomputer scale. So it's using these NVIDIA A100 tensor cores. They have 80 gigabytes of memory per GPU, and it has eight of these uh, in this SKU. It's got an NVIDIA Quantum InfiniBand networking, 200 gigabytes per second, and then 40 gigabits per second of just regular Azure networking. It's got this new PCI Gen 4 architecture, GPU Direct RDMA for each GPU, 1900 gigabytes of RAM, 96 CPU cores. And these claim some of the top, I think four places in the top 500 supercomputing list. So some really big virtual machines. I'm not gonna demo that in my subscription. I could not afford it. But they're out there if you have those kind of really big uh, AI workloads. And then the DCV3 is now available in Europe West and Europe North. So remember the whole point about the DC is this is this confidential computing SKUs. They use the NVIDIA SGX, so that's those secure guard extensions. These give me secure enclaves, so encrypted memory that I write my applications to use. And the big deal about the V3s is it was like this 1500 times increase in the amount of encrypted memory up to I think 256 gigabytes. So really huge amounts there. On the networking, site-to-site -site VPN has increased the number of tunnels from 30 to 100 for a lot of the SKUs. 
I think it's the VPN gateway 4, 5, and the AZ variants all now support 100 tunnels instead of 30. On the storage side, SFTP for Blob is now in preview. So this is native to the Blob service. I can now SFTP to it. So this obviously, we want to see this. So if I jump over for a second, so we will quickly go and look at my storage account. And this has to be a general purpose V2 or a premium block blob account. And it's just using the regular blob endpoint. So what I'm gonna quickly do is look at my SFTP storage account I created. This is in preview, you have to sign up for the preview. And then what you'll actually see is this new SFTP option. So SFTP, you're gonna, I've enabled it, which is why it says disable. The accounts are local to the storage account. So it's not integrated with Azure AD or anything like that. So you create an account, which is either and or password and or certificate. So you pick what you're doing, then you specify the permissions it has. You can specify a home directory and everything else. The storage account has to be enabled for hierarchical namespace, i.e. true folders. But I have done exactly that. So if we go and look here, I've got this folder one, and I've got a folder called John for the user I have created. Now, if I now jump over to my very ancient looking command prompt, I'm having a bit of fun with terminal. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna SFTP to that. So let me just quickly have a look at what's in this folder. So I'm gonna wanna put a file there. Okay, so we're gonna SFTP. So notice the format of the name is the storage account name and then the username and then you're using the blob endpoint, the regular blob endpoint. Now I'm accessing this over the internet. This would also work over a private endpoint. And again, it would be the blob private endpoint that this would actually be using. So then I'm gonna go and paste my password in. Oh. Let's check in the fingerprint. Let me do that one more time. And I'm now connected. So I'm connected to SFTP. If I do, where am I? I'm in John. And I can see that file there. And just to prove this kind of works, if I do a put on, we'll do that file, atk screenshot.png. So it did the upload. And now if we jump back to our storage account and refresh, there it is in that container. So now we have native SFTP um, in Blob. Again, it's in preview, you have to kind of sign up for it, but that's, that's pretty huge. Today, people might be having to create appliances or something to do SFTP. Now Blob just natively has that. Once you've signed up for the preview and you've got the hierarchical namespace. Likewise, uh, NFS 4.1 on Azure Files is now GA. So providing now I have that uh, premium storage account uh, ad for files, that could be LRS or ZRS, when I now go and create a share, I can specify, hey, do I want that share to be SMB or NFS? It can't be both. But if I now go and look at one of my premium file shares, and I'll go and create a new share, we can see down here, we pick. Hey, is it SMB or NFS? If I pick NFS, I can choose things like the root squash. So it doesn't matter what permissions I actually have, it will crush it down to like an NFS nobody. But now I can go ahead and use NFS with that. Now a key point of this today is it's not using authentication. So what I have to do is when I use this capability, I can only access it from a secured network endpoint. So what secured network endpoint means is if you think about that, that storage account right there, well, I'm either gonna be accessing that from, if you think about that, this is the storage account for the files. If I have my virtual network, either I've got a particular subnet I've enabled for service endpoint. So I've got the service endpoint that I'm allowing to that storage account or the other option is I'm creating a private endpoint 
to that particular instance. Obviously, private endpoint has the benefit of peered networks or connected networks like express route, private peering or site to site VPN would also be able to leverage it. But I have to be doing one of those things uh, to actually be able to take advantage of that. But that is now GA. Uh, ADE data copy with Azure Data Factory and Synapse is now GA. So the whole point of this is what I can do is now Azure Data Explorer, there's a new connector for both Azure Data Factory and Synapse that I can do mapping data flows actually into Azure Data Explorer, that large data ingestion and analytics platform. Miscellaneous. So Citrix now has Azure VMware solution support for its virtual apps and desktop solutions, so that's GA. The Azure VMware solution Jetstream DR solution is also now GA, so that's on-premises, vSphere, private clouds to AVS, or an AVS to another AVS. So it's that replication fell over technology, that's GA. AVS is also now available in Japan, West and France Central. East Asia. Asia, Asia now has availability zones. That's generally available. There's a new Sweden central region that includes availability zone support. And the authenticator application that hopefully a lot of us are using has got a bunch of new updates. Remember, this is the app that we're gonna run on our phone. So one of the updates is now, we're used to the idea of maybe seeing a number, and then on the authenticator app, we see three numbers and we pick the one we saw. Well, we still might accidentally kind of approve that without thinking it through. So now instead of seeing a bunch of numbers, we'll see a little keypad and we have to type in the number that we see. So we have that more precise method of confirming. We can also turn on location information and app information about what is generating that sign-in request. It will show a little map. This is where something is trying to sign in as and accessing this particular application. Conditional access can now use GPS coordinates instead of the location based on the IP. So if I jump over and look at my Azure Active Directory, and I'll go and look at my security, and if I look at my named locations, well now I can create a new country location, but notice I have this option, determine location by GPS coordinates. So instead of using, hey, just what the IP address is, I can actually use the GPS coordinates. Now, all these great authenticator app features, well, there's also the ability to drive a registration campaign. So if people use a less secure MFA option, just like a text message, or well, after they've authenticated it, I prompt them, hey, do you wanna go and set up the app? So through authentication methods right here, what I can actually do now is I can drive a registration campaign. So I can go and set this up. So now users will actually be prompted and say, hey, um, why don't we take this opportunity to go and set up the Authenticator app and get that much better and more secure um, authentication experience. And that is all of the updates. So I, I hope that was useful. If you're in the US, hopefully you'll have a fantastic Thanksgiving. I will be eating a lot of turkey. Um, but until the next video, everyone take care.